This episode is brought to you by Wanted. Wanted is a career platform from Korea with over 10,000 companies and 2 million plus users using the platform for talent recruitment and career growth. Since 2015, Wanted's mission has been to bring fulfillment and happiness to all professionals around the world, offering the best job opportunities and best in class career content to support professional learning and growth. Adding on to the growth and innovation, Wanted introduces to you Roundup. Roundup is a video interview collaboration tool for every team. With a simple download of the Chrome browser extension, Roundup invites you and your team to host hiring interviews on Google Meet, share interview evaluations, then round up all interviewer comments in a single dashboard, all to help your team efficiently reach the best hiring decision. It is currently free and available on www.roundup.ai. Hi, I'm Adrian Tan, and this is my podcast where I deep dive into matters surrounding HR tech and the future of work. I was a former HR serial entrepreneur and write extensively about the future of work on my blog. You may know me better through the Singapore HR tech market map that I created in 2017. In this podcast, I speak with the people who are enabling the future of work. From mindfulness coach to employee engagement platform, they are all helping companies to better navigate rising work and business demands. I'm hoping that sharing in this podcast will help you better prepare yourself and your business for what the future of work may bring. My guest today is Jayan Paletti. He's a co-founder of Darwin Boss and is currently their head of sales. Darwin Boss is a technology company that provides cloud-based workforce management and analytic application for businesses. Before co-founding Darwin Box, Giant worked as a consultant at EY across functions like merchant acquisition and private equity. He completed his MBA from the Indian Institute of Management. Hey, Giant. Thank you for coming on to the show. Hey, Adrian. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the show today. Could you help the audience understand a bit more about yourself and chain of events to land you into Darwin Box? Uh, so my background, Adrian, I was a trained engineer before I got my MBA in finance. So I was a banker for a really long time. Did a lot of work in M&A and private equity syndication across the healthcare and life sciences space in Asia. Before turning entrepreneur with, with Darwin Box, two other co-founders that did Darwin that started that came together and started Darwin Box along with me. And the origin story for Darwin Box was that when I was a banker and I, I was part of a fairly large M&A transaction where so this was for a pharma outfit based out of India, where, where an international acquirer was coming in to buy that outfit. And and what finally happened was because people were an important part of the entire, or one important reason why the MA transaction was happening. It was a very R&D intensive setup. And R&D incentive setups, by the, by the very nature, are people-driven. Right? So getting the right people, the right talent in the transaction would be very crucial. And, and as part of the entire MA process, there's something called due diligence that takes place, right? So at the right stage. And the international acquirer was coming in to do a due diligence of the company. And I asked the promoter and the management to actually have all their metrics around people, around talent and HR in place before the diligence process began. And I sent them the long list of items, right? starting with attrition, education, breakdown, segment-wise breakdown, performance-wise breakdowns, all these, uh, qualification-wise breakdowns. So standard HR analytics package that I actually sent them as a list saying, hey, let's have all these data points ready. And the client were, and the acquirer was due to visit town in a week. And when the week happened and we realized we didn't have the data in place. And the acquirer was surprised and said, hey, like how, meaning you're running such a very heavy HR intensive ship, but you don't have this data together. And that is actually the first time I realized, hey, this is such critical core information that a company needs to have. How come the company doesn't have it handy? This is almost six and a half years ago. Right, and that is when the genesis of the company began. And we went, uh, went back to understand why this happened. Why is such crucial information not technically ready at the click of a button? And what was your hypothesis back then? Why are companies not keen or not ready with this kind of information? One, of course, it was also about companies' orientation to invest in digital. But the second was also the availability or the lack there of good HR technology platforms. And we felt we were at a stage in terms of a technology cycle where the importance of being digital was rising. Come, every company understands it. Second, we felt uh, if you built a system that accounts for the needs of customers, the needs of the region in a far superior fashion, and maybe I can talk about those in a bit, 
we'll be able to build a, a meaningful product and thus a meaningful business. So I just want to also segue into the most recent investment made, made both by a Salesforce, which came into place and I think really surprised many people in the HR tech market because Salesforce has always been more in the sales side, not exactly in the HR side. Could you elaborate more about this investment and how did that come about and how do you foresee that affecting or improving the experience for your customers as well as all your partners? Absolutely. Our Salesforce investment, it's very strategic in nature. And I'll tell uh, a few reasons why that sort of happened. Right? And we, we, own, we are the core system of record, single source of truth for anything related to an employee. And Salesforce is the single source of truth for anything related to a customer of a company. So they, we are two critical systems of record. And there are many places or many areas where integrations or points of overlap exist, where both systems can work together. And, and we realized we worked with, we've integrated with Salesforce in several companies across Asia. We have, for example, Darwin Box is around 550 customers, almost 1.2 million employees that love and use the platform every day. And these are spread, they're executed across Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, India, parts of Europe. So companies across the world, but a large concentration of them exist in Asia, use Darwin Box. And several of these large brands also use Salesforce for their customer-related uh, transformation exercises. And, so, and the, consequently, because HR data is needed by those applications as well, we've integrated with them several times. And they got to hear good things about us from several clients and they came and said, guys, we really like the work that you're doing. We like how you approach problem solving at clients. And we also invest in companies. Here in the Valley, we backed several companies. Right? Meaning, for example, Salesforce is a big investor in the Valley. We take companies like a Zoom, an Automation Anywhere, a MuleSoft, a lot of great companies that they backed from their growth stages all the way up to IPO. And they haven't done anything of this format in Asia before. So we are technically their first tech investment or enterprise software investment in the Asian region. Yeah. But like I said, it came because clients had great things to say about us. And, and they were interested in, in what we were. For us, I think what will help for us, one of the reasons why we really like to partner, one, this was this is the greatest cloud, cloud company on the planet. The word cloud in a lot of cases on the enterprise side became synonymous with it. 20, 25 years of journey that they've had in the cloud space. So much to learn from them. So much to take away. So I think that is what was really exciting for us. So what can you learn from them on technology, on platformization, on how you can maximize value delivered to a customer. This is what was really exciting for us. And we intend to, like I said, go to market with them. For example, in all the geographies we are in, we want to be in. They have strong, deeply penetrated networks. Can you leverage those networks to go to those geographies? and accelerate your go-to-market agenda there. The second, of course, is can you deliver more value to a lot of common clients that you have? So now Salesforce is at a client, Darwin Box is at a client. We were two independent entities before January. But after January, we are now together. Okay, how can you maximize a joint proposition at a client? Can you build something at the intersection of sales and marketing cloud and the HR cloud to deliver more value? So essentially, Salesforce is investing in you guys to provide you with more lessons that you can take on to better improve your product. And what is one of the key things, knowing what Salesforce does and what they do successfully, what's some of the key things that you hope to emulate through this partnership with them that you can bring forward across to your users as well as your customers? Absolutely. And there are several things to learn from them. So maybe if you break it down, one, like I said, on product and platformization. Now, they've built a platform that has scaled to millions of users globally. And we are, compared to them at least, very early in terms of our journey. So as your client base scales, as the complexity of client rises, as you do more and more geographies, we are 1.2 million employees on the platform. We'll be 2 million soon, we'll be 3 million, we'll be 5 million. And with scale comes more complexity. And, and because they've seen a lot of scale before, can you, and, and when scaling, a lot of things also break sometimes, right? Now, with them advising you, with them having your back, you don't have to fall in learn. You can learn mm -hmm. from them. I think, so that is one. The second is uh, platformization. And if, there is, and if there is something that you can call a platform in the enterprise software side, it is Salesforce. So many applications that, that reside on the Salesforce sort of platform 
to do to to deliver more value for a customer so now there is a there is a set of application stroke platform that salesforce offers but they have enough in terms of they've created enough pipes enough rails on top of their product for more and more applications to get built and that is an aspiration of ours as well right there are uh, very few situations where a platform is possible and we strongly believe that a platform is possible in the hr tech space especially if you own the system of record so davin box is a system of record right it, it it is a single source of truth for anything related to an employee so there are several parts of the product that you can platformize so make it open so that more and more application can build can get built on top of your platform there's again something that we intend to learn from them so that is on the product and technology and integration side the second is how do you solve for customer success how do you solve for implementation at scale again salesforce immensely client focused right go out of the way to deliver immense and maximize value delivered to clients so can you learn from some of the best practices how how they value, uh, they deliver value we we've done a great job of solving for our client needs ensuring that they are happy and ensuring that they are successful but there are so many more things that we believe we can do and can you learn from them there third again a uh, lot to learn from them on 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 hr culture and a bunch of ancillary pieces so right again this is a company that has thousands of employees globally across every conceivable geography but if you go to any geography any country and talk to salesforce employees you realize that the values are the same so amazing how they've retained that core value system and for example they call they have this concept called ohana where they said hey, ohana is a hawaiian for family they consider every employee a part of their family they consider every sales every extended partner in the salesforce ecosystem they consider their investee companies a part of ohana which is the salesforce family right again so many things to emulate and learn from them in terms of hr practices and culture and the kind of people that you want on board as you scale and again like i said we are in a very fairly rapid uh, pace of growth right? we are we were three people with a dream 6 years ago we are 550 people now globally across asia and how do you continue to maintain uh, the same value system how do you scale culture as the org scales so many things that you could and these are things that uh, by the way they have already made introductions to to all the right teams in the uh, within the salesforce ecosystem for us to learn and take away so things of this format it so basically sitting on the shoulders of giants and of course having this giants show you the things that they have done it before how how they're going to do it so that you don't really have to reinvent the wheel absolutely and i'm quite amazed to know that over the past 6 years you have grown from 3 to more than 500 people and that definitely send a very strong signal on the kind of unique propositions that you are able to bring to the market which of course will also lead me to really find out more on that unique proposition because you are also in Singapore right now and Singapore is quite a cluttered market based on my understanding there are so many of them that the HRMS space essentially is almost becoming a commoditized space so why firstly you are looking into Singapore and most importantly what are what is some of your unfair advantage that you believe give you an edge and the confidence to come into a Singapore market absolutely there is so much accumulated learning from within the salesforce ecosystem that any investee company of their of theirs can can benefit from so i think that is what we we, we intend to dip into that pool of learning so that we can learn from them and scale from and scale meaningfully now coming to your second point around the singapore market and the opportunity there and while and you are right adrian this is one of the primary systems of record in a company right this seg- this segment hrms hcm as a category has existed for the last 35 40 years and at the outset one it looks like there are a lot of players but if you break it down right and if you if you segmentize this particular sort of proposition one davin box from the beginning our focus has been enterprise or mid market going after large customers that's that's our focus so the average davin box customer is has around 2500 to 3000 employees right that is one so does your product have the ability to solve for the complex needs of a company of that format of 2500 plus sort of headcount 3000 plus headcount you suddenly multi geography 
You have complex needs across the life cycle. Your workflows need, need far more robustness. My performance management exercise is very important. My needs from a strategic HR perspective are very high. When I'm a 200 employee company, I know who exactly my performers are. But when I'm a 10,000 employee company, I'm really, really keen to understand who are the 5% of people in the org who are actually driving the org forward. How do I engage them really well? How do I ensure that each one of them don't attract? So critical strategic problems that come when you are when your enterprise, when you're large, right? So strategic needs taking over, the importance of being more robust, need, workflows being complex. So while so that is on one side. The second is remember that HR is a segment, unlike say other categories of software, say you have categories of software like uh, developer tools, collaboration platforms, productivity tools, best practices and consequently software can be the same globally. But when you come to HR, the importance of the local context cannot be underestimated. Singaporeans think a certain way. Indonesians have a certain working style. Asians overall have a certain mind frame, which is why a lot of policies are influenced by local culture. I'll give you a small example. Right? So Asia is a region with very high power distance. Some of the number of approvals that you probably need here to get to a maybe important outcome is probably higher than what in the West. For example, there are very unique workflows that exist in the region, right? I was speaking to somebody in Indonesia last week, and they were telling me we have this very peculiar thing called absconding or no-show. Where an employee was working till today, suddenly stops coming to work tomorrow. If you go ask a, a, a non-Asia-based platform who's not building for the region to configure something like this, then say, what do you mean? Why can't the employee go raise notice? But there are nuances like this that exist in Asia. And, and if you combine those two, like I said, if you, if you combine enterprise-grade functionality plus architecture and scalability with local context, suddenly the number of solutions that can do both come down very significantly. Very significantly. See, uh, the clutter that you talk about, you see a lot of clutter in the small, medium sort of a segment. But when you come to large, when you come to enterprise, the companies that can solve for a large company's context, for example, I have to, I have to, I'm a very large conglomerate. I have eight different businesses across, across some 60 different legal entities, across 20 odd international geographies. Can you replicate my structure for me? Can you replicate my core workflow support? There are few, there are only a few systems globally that can replicate that kind of a complexity. And apart from the legacy branded players that you've heard of historically, the likes of SAP, Oracle, and Workday, we are one more that can tackle that kind of complexity. And our advantage as compared to them in the Asian region is that we are also built for Asia. And our platform can account for these very, very unique nuances that exist in the region. On account of which maybe, like I said, the big boys, their platform, their adoption, their usage has not been the most optimum at the end customer. Like I said, because of the lack of this regional nuance. And like we solve for that really, really well. Which is why customers are choosing to partner with us, like I said, in a very short time frame, getting to 550 customers, almost 1.2 million employees on the platform. It is because our value proposition was unique. So the fact that you're based in Asia definitely helps for you to cater to those nuances, which you mentioned a great point that the likes of the success factor, Oracle, they these are all Western companies and without their main HQ around this part of the world, obviously priorities will gravitate more towards where they are comfortable at, which means if there's something very unique that people need to be taken care of in Indonesia. On the other aspect of uh, Singapore, which is really a report that I came across some time back, and this is actually a survey done by ASME and Microsoft Singapore. Many companies, SMEs here primarily, which are, are actually aware of the need for digital transformation. And in fact, 83% of SMEs have digital transformation strategies, but 60% of them will gauge their effort to be a failure. Again, this is something unique to Singapore. Based on your observation of the market, why do you think this is the case? And what can company do otherwise to be a bit more successful in this area? Yeah, great question, Adrian. And uh, by the way, we ran a a similar survey, uh, Adrian, I think we, we ran a survey with around 150-odd fairly well-known Asian enterprises. And our findings were similar, right? Which they said that 82% of the organizations that we surveyed have undergone or are planning to undergo a HR transformation exercise by the end of 2021. So there is a strong intent to be distilled. 
and so, something that became very clear after last year first wave right first wave of the pandemic right the, the companies like i said the importance of being digital is far more well understood even the most traditional of companies even the most traditional of companies coming back and saying that we want to transform and we want to be digital tell us how and and let me maybe start by saying that well 2020 was all about digital or people tech being used to react to the crisis so last year because okay suddenly a lot of companies had to go remote and it was a lack of choice so the only way for companies to operate in this sort of new paradigm in this sort of new way of working was to become digital but 2021 it's becoming very clear in all my conversations that it's all about how you use digital or people tech and how that will become a cornerstone of a company's larger business strategy and if you go and check the annual report of any company and if you see any forward looking statements there the usage of the word digital maybe from where it was two years ago three years ago to now it must have increased 10 times the word digital or technology so that is one and and again let me go back to paint a picture of what i saw last year in terms of from a people tech perspective or work tech perspective specifically last year organizations have navigated through that in phases so for the first few months post the pandemic right so april may june time frame so companies were using people tech in asia to get back to business as usual while ensuring the safety and well-being of their employees that was phase one the second phase was about how you can use people tech to drive productivity while being remote. That was phase two. And as we entered the last few months of the year, last year and this new year, this has not just now become about productivity or BCP, but it has now become about how do you extend that to a lot of other strategic parts of HR. Like how can we extend people tech to engagement in culture building? Especially given that the blurring lines between our professional and personal life now, Singapore is under lockdown, parts of India are under lockdown. So now, the, the line between your professional and personal life is completely blurred. So a lot of thinking now with an organization, how can you use technology to enable the overall well-being of an employee? Physical, mental, familial. And now, now to just come specifically to the question that you asked, right? Around while 82% have undergone or are, are very keen to do a digital transformation exercise, a substantial chunk coming back and saying digital transformation exercises have not been successful. And one thing that I've noticed is uh, you're, you're absolutely right that digital can be overwhelming, especially now given that, given you see this, this huge influx of solutions that, that are coming in. So one thing is, it's very important that a strong transformation roadmap exists that will stitch together these various solutions, not just in HR, but across the organization life cycle that are getting taken. So it makes sense for every stakeholder in the company and delivers the outcomes expected. So like I said, one is very important to have a strong transformation roadmap. And like I said, a lack of a transformation or a coherent transformation roadmap or digital vision will result in failure. So which is, so getting, it's very important to have very clear preset objectives, success metrics, and knowing why we're going, going about doing an exercise. Not doing digital for the sake of doing digital, but doing it because we're driving some org outcomes and understanding and capturing those outcomes and gunning for those. That is one. The second is a temporary digital strategy that fails to scale. Okay, come, I've now just implemented this and moved on. It's very important to note that a digital transformation exercise is a journey. There is phase one, okay, this is what I'll do this year. Here is a preliminary milestone that I will come to. Here's what I'll do next year. Here's what I'll do the year after. So it's very important to have a long-term strategy around digital, not just a temporary strategy. Here I've, completed, I've come implement a SEM platform, I've moved on. That is not enough. The third is, of course, a poorly managed uh, chain management exercise is oftentimes the reason for not seeing success. So ultimately, you, you now configured a platform, built out a platform, implemented it, and delivered it. But people in the org don't know how to use it, don't have an intent to use it, because they've done things in a certain way historically. Unless you come and drive home a point saying, hey, this is how it's going to impact your life, this is why I have to do it, this is why it impacts all outcomes better, so doing and showing that a change management exercise is done in a very nice manner. The last, of course, is technology and digital should get combined with the right kind of skill set to truly see benefit. Again, if, if the users of the platform are not digitally savvy, they are not oriented to, to use a product that got implemented, it will not be used. I mean, see, there are, like I said, you can have the greatest of products in the work space. 
But if they are not used by the rank and file of the organization, there is no point to this. So ultimately, creating the right orientation and the right kind of skill so that digital can be leveraged really well. And I'll give you another example, right? Say, for example, as digital grows, they will be able to see very massive aggregation of data. Information that was never captured before is getting captured. Every click, every touch point is getting captured. And so this data is like a gold mine, is, or it's like uncut diamonds. So if you don't cut them, it is just sad because you're not leveraging all the advantage that you will get. And so it's very important that so much data is aggregated, but if there is no data competency in the organization, then it will not be leveraged. And the organizations that, that, that have this competency within, uh, within a sector will definitely become market leaders. So in, in my mind, five years later, six years later, 10 years later, like how both of us are able to use Excel, data science will become the new Excel. So, so much data is there and every at every level of the org, in every function of the org, people should know how to leverage it. That is when orgs will get disproportionate advantage. So, those are four quick summary items on why I think digital and transformation exercise don't succeed. Like I said, one, the first one was the lack of a coherent transformation roadmap in digital vision. The second was not thinking of digital transformation as a journey or thinking it is very temporary, it is not, it should be a long-term strategy around this too. The third is poorly executed change management. The fourth, technology getting combined or mapped with the right kind of skill set. Digital transformation, as much as it is uh, initiated by people, it also seems to be derailed by the same set of people because they may not be ready for the change and also importantly they may not have the skill set to undergo all this change so it's really all about trying to better prepare the people who are going to support and enable all these changes and also significantly and importantly to ensure everyone has the right buy-in so that this entire exercise can definitely be something relevant. So I, I think the key thing here really is about the change management which to a large extent many companies may not be prepared to go through or may have underestimated the significant amount of resistance Absolutely. that people always present. Maybe from the extent, oh, it's just a, it's a new system. I'm so happy with the old system. It may be sucky, but I'm uncomfortable with it. Or maybe to a more extreme example, which would be, okay, if this is going to happen, does it mean I'm not leaned anymore? Is this going to cost me my job? So how, how would a company and how would you suggest a company tackle all these kind of questions, this kind of uh, elephant in the room up front? What are some of the aspects that they should be mindful of in order to ensure that the people elements are well sorted before they even look into any form of transformation? If you if you come to any Darwin box office, right, be it our Singapore office or Philippines office or Indonesia office, one thing that you'll see in big, bold and blue, pasted at the entrance always is a quote from our name father, which is Charles Darwin, right? named after Charles Darwin, uh, hence the name Darwin Box, is, uh, and, the, and, the, and the quote that is alluded to him that we, that we paste everywhere is, it is not the strongest of a species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that is the most responsive to change. And is that happening through and road? The rate of mm. change uh, that you see in the last 20 years, as compared to the 20 years before that, as compared to the 28 uh, years before that, it's been very rapid. For example, you, took, you look at the average company lifespan. The average company lifespan has now come to a number that is less than 15 years, from maybe 20 plus 20 years ago. The number of companies that are part of the Fortune 1000 that survived up to 100 years ago to now is probably five or less than five. So companies are not surviving for long. And if you again look at companies from 15 years ago, right? So 2007, I remember that. If you look at the top five companies in the world in terms of market in terms of market capitalization or revenue, and if you look at the top five now, the only one that is common is Microsoft. There is no. The other four have changed. And one thing is very clear that software is taking over the world. And so now in the top five, you'll see all digital or software companies in some format. And the reason I'm saying all this is, it is, and orgs now appreciate the importance of being digital, agile, and change ready. I think every leader now, uh, one of the most important strategic priorities that they have when you speak to them is, okay, I'm a large company. Large must not be equivalent to being unagile. They said, how can I be agile while still being large? It's an important question that, that they keep asking. 
and the really forward looking companies and some interesting things that they've done from a evaluation perspective at least is at at every role in the company they are also checking for this uh, competency called change or disk orientation which is say now you have any number of roles in, in a company but one competency that they want to keep common is change or disk readiness because ultimately if your people are ready in terms of change the org consequently is ultimately a sum total of all the people coming together to achieve magic right the org consequently will be far more change ready so it's a competency the really really forward looking companies that i've talked to they're actually testing for this competency at the entry level at a mid management level whenever they are hiring for a role they've added that competency to get tested So these are a few interesting things that I've seen anecdotally. It seems like the people element really require a fair bit of work. And for companies that may have already tackled this, they have the uh, right head count, the right competency. They are ready to move on to the next step. But having said that, we are in quite an uncertain economic environment right now with COVID nineteen flaring up and down. You don't really know where we are heading. Is it even a good time for company to look into any form of digital transformation? Uh, the last two quarters in Darwin Box have been the best quarters ever in in our history, and that is also a consequence of market, right? And the market's sudden appreciation for understanding the importance of being digital. Companies now understand that hey, if we are not being digital, if we are not being change ready, it will become very, very tough for us to continue to be do what we are doing. And that appreciation is, in, in fact, let me go to the extent of saying that in the last one year, four or five years worth of shift in thinking around being digital has happened. And what I am noticing anecdotally in the market is, if you have the balance sheet strength to invest, and if you have the bandwidth to implement, companies are going at an uh, Become uh, doing digital transformation exercise. Before we wrap up the conversation, I'd like to understand from you when we talk about the future of work. How do you envision things to be like when it comes to future of work within your target segment, three to five years down the road? How do you foresee things to be different? You mentioned earlier on where people will be using data or applying data science, like we are applying or using Excel sheets right now. Any other forthcoming changes or vision that you have when it comes to the future of work? on that adrian one let me also elaborate further on on data right and i talked about change readiness agility and especially in large organizations one of the ways to really drive agility is to decentralize decision making right and for you to decentralize decision making at every level of the company democratizing access to data becomes very very important so that's one one important part of the future of work that i see which is at every level for for example an employee will get access to all the data that is needed for him to perform at an optimal level it could be hr data it could be data that is related to his other day to day activities likewise for a manager and he'll get all the data about his reportees and plus more a hod more and what that means is now if everybody if data access becomes very democratized of course while maintaining very, very strong governance right why should the hod of this department get data from another department it doesn't have to so while maintaining strong governance that's an important element that is one way to drive a lot more agility and like i said data i think uh, will be a big part of the entire future of work piece the second i also envisage that a lot of ua use cases right around ai ml again being used not just at a company level usage of these technologies now restricted to a few organizations a few functions within an organization but again they are getting democratized access to these technologies so that it increases the functioning of an employee on the ground the second the third piece i think is a lot of change in structures that i am suspect from future work so historically org structures etc they have operate in a certain way and what i think is going forward the manager employee relationship right and you realize that is the fundamental building block on which the entire org structure gets built that's also fundamentally going to change i realize uh, going forward that managers will also have to don the hat of a hr manager in a lot of cases and you realize that unlike the historical model where especially in asia where you saw employ where you saw for every 100 150 employees we need to have a hr that kind of a model is not going to work anymore right you realize that companies scale from 500 to 1000 to 2000 while 
the hr sort of function only scaling not very linearly right okay you add one you become double the size but you just added one hr person so it's like that and a lot more technology getting used by the hr function to drive outcomes and a lot of the work around the engagement piece at least at an employee level i expect the managers to also don the role of a hr bp stock hr manager the manager role and its significance in my mind is going to rise dramatically and so awesome. these are three four themes that i see of course a, a lot of changes from a technology perspective on the ground can have any length of conversation around the technology changes that exist but thematically uh, i think these three th- big themes that personally i feel will emerge very soon and all of us would be very eagerly looking forward to that eventuality with all these interesting things that is happening within the system and for all the sharings that you have done today Thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thanks so much, Adrian. Thank you for listening to the podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to more information about our guests and their businesses. If you enjoyed this podcast, it would be helpful to give a review on iTunes or follow me on Spotify. If you are using Overcast, please hit the star button under the episode. That will help get this episode and podcast out to more people who may find it useful. I'll see you in the next episode of the Agent Han Show.